reactivity series chapter number 14 actually we call it reactivity series but it would be more accurate if i call it a list it simply is a list of elements and most of them are actually metals and they are arranged in the order of decreasing reactivity which means the top one on the list would be the most reactive and the bottommost element would be the least reactive that's what this series is all about. Now, this series is going to really help you understand a lot of things about metals or the members of the series. Now, before we get started, any kind of reactions that go through the series, on your left, you have the series, and we actually tend to bifurcate this series into different parts, so it's, it's easy, easier for the students to, one, memorize the series, two, understand the parts of the series and actually ask the questions accordingly. So uh, getting started with it, you'd notice that this series is made up of elements, but some of them are written without brackets and some of them are written with brackets. Now, mm -hmm. let's try to find the elements that are written with brackets. I'm going to underline those. You'll find carbon in brackets. You'll find hydrogen in brackets. The purpose of sure. doing that is to, mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. So those are non metals, right? Right. The purpose of doing that is to make sure that the student quickly understand that this is the non metal among the list of all the metals. So it actually is really helpful for the student to understand. Uh, that in a huge series of metals, we have a few non metals in there too. Right. So yeah. As soon as we as soon as you get that, I actually don't take these as a list of metals and non-metals. I actually tend to call them junctions. So it's easier for me to divide the series into three parts. Now, before the first non-metal is the first part of the reactivity series. In between both the non-metals, although we have just a couple of elements, but that would be the second part of the reactivity series. And below the second non-metal would be the third and last part of the activity series. If I bifurcate them, it would be easier to say that these ones are the most reactive ones, right? And yeah. these ones are moderately reactive ones. Means these are reactive, but there are more reactive elements uh, in comparison to these two. And of course they're on top them and these are the least reactive ones so that's a very good way to bifurcate them mm -hmm. right so we have potassium sodium lithium calcium magnesium aluminium uh, in the most reactive part we have just zinc and iron in moderately reactive part and the least reactive ones would be copper silver gold Apart from that, it gives you the idea that potassium is going to be the most reactive among the whole series, and coal is going to be the least reactive among the whole series. Well, sometimes there are questions that hint to another addition to the series, so I tend to ask my students to add another one at the bottom of the list, and this should be platinum. There are some past papers, though not exactly the IGCSE past papers, I'm talking about beyond 2013. Uh, so that was GCSE papers, and they actually tend to discuss something even lesser reactive than gold, and that would be platinum. Now, <clears throat> this actually divides the series into three parts and actually make it easier for you to remember. Now, there are many methods to uh, remember the names of the series in order. Remember, you need to memorize these names in order. You can't move their positions. You can't remember sodium after lithium or lithium after calcium because that's not, not how it works. So you actually need to memorize them in order. Since you need to memorize them in order, there are many ways to do that. Now the student tend to actually memorize the first letter of every element to memorize the whole series. Uh, for example, they'd memorize T, S, L, C, M, A, C, Z, I, some, 
something like this then they come up with actium sodium lithium calcium magnesium aluminum and they work it like this this is a good way to do it there are some sentences over the internet some funny sentences uh mnemonic that we call them that help students to memorize the series for example please send large crates of then there are monkeys alligators cheetahs zebras and i don't know so many animals in heavy crates uh, soon uh, goodbye uh, please or something like that there is a big sentence i i really actually don't remember that sentence but mnemonics actually make it easier for students to remember stuff like that there is however another way to remember it students tend to go with that way too this one is on the symbolism list is a this one is n a this one is l i this one is c a this one is m g this one is a l so students tend to go with kanaka magalpi something like this the, this becomes a rhyming poem i i don't know which method you like which method you find easy uh, easier than the other so it's really up to you whether you'd like to go with mnemonics a huge sentence or just the first letters or their symbols but you need to memorize them in order now since we have already talked about yeah, go ahead also sorry uh, the most reactive ones they they all have u and m at last yeah that that no. again a good idea to remember them mm, yeah okay okay well i never thought it, i would see it that way but that's a really good point for well, students who actually have to memorize this it can come up with really many different techniques like he just came up with one so it's really up to you how you tend to memorize it yeah and okay. i have seen students coming up with a whole lot of different techniques to memorize it so uh, be my guest come up with anything funny anything mnemonic anything uh, with symbolism anything common in between those and you can memorize it right so yeah uh, apart from all of this since this is a reactivity series and we need to basket them on the basis of reactivity so it's not just that we put them in a list without a reason actually we put them in the list uh, and we place them very carefully now one might argue why are we putting magnesium in most reactive ones and not and why not in the moderately reactive ones or why not in the least reactive ones and there must be a reason or an argument uh, proving why magnesium is a part of ones on top why iron is a part of ones in uh, in the center or why gold is a part of one at bottom so in order to cover those arguments let's go with a few experiments the first one that your book starts with are displacement reactions and these displacement reactions involve metal oxide now displacement means that in this reaction a more reactive metal or a non metal is going to displace the less reactive one so of course if the reaction occurs this proves that there is the more reactive species present which was able to go with the whole displacement displacement reaction and actually to be honest which made the whole reaction possible let's take an example this is a black and gray mixture in this one we have copper dioxide and magnesium powder now in these reactions remember the more reactive one is taken in its original form and the less reactive one is usually taken in the compound or solution form this means if magnesium is present in its pure form this must be more reactive and if copper is present in its compound form this must be less reactive now if the reaction occurs it would prove the same sentence i just said which means it would prove magnesium to be more reactive and copper would be less reactive then we have a ceramic paper we have a gauze we have a tripod stand we heat it and if the reaction proceeds that means magnesium is definitely more reactive than copper and the reaction actually does proceed the white portion you can see over here is magnesium reacting with oxygen produ producing magnesium oxide and the white ash so take note for this demonstration goggles or a face shield are needed 
actually I recommend both. Together with safety screens in a well-ventilated room, the bench should be protected by a large sheet of cardboard. The pupil should be at the back of the room. One gram of mixture is strongly heated in a metal ground bottle cap before retiring to the back of the room to wait a violent reaction. If nothing happens after a minute or so, turn off the gas, do not touch the mixture, but leave it to cool and dispose of it in water. So this is a big safety note for a reaction like this. Now, since displacement reaction can be really violent, and that really depends upon which element you are using, so you get the idea that we need to perform them really carefully. Now, this one isn't uh, an experiment that students perform on their own. This is actually a teacher's demonstration, hence the note started off with demonstration. And even for that demonstration, you stay far up ahead uh, from this whole experiment and you wait it to happen and you actually see it from a good distance. Now, in order to prove my point, notice they have used magnesium powder over here. And actually on this list, magnesium is not the first, not the second. This is the fifth element on the list, which means that these reactions can even be more violent or explosive if we tend to use any of the first four metals that we even didn't, we didn't even think about it because yeah, of course that would be more violent. So I hope you get the idea why we are putting them on the top of the list. Now magnesium powder and copper two oxide are mixed together and heated very strongly. And at the end traces of white magnesium oxide, which I was calling magnesium oxide ash are left in the ceramic paper. The actual reaction proceeds in such a way that in this oxide, magnesium literally takes place of copper and pushes copper aside and is a separate metal. This is an example of displacement reaction. Clearly, magnesium being more reactive, displaced copper from its compound, made its own compound and pushed metal, the copper metal being less reactive aside. So the less reactive metal copper has been displaced from its compound by the more reactive magnesium which is the actual rule for displacement. So you can easily define displacement. A more reactive metal or a more reactive element can displace the less reactive one from its compound. So any metal higher in the reactivity series would displace any one down from a compound. Now this is yeah. the first thing you need, need, need to learn. So this clearly gives you the idea that if the examiner comes up with a reaction, you should be capable of completing the reaction by telling him the product. Let's do a simple practice to make sure you get the point. Now, keep this simple example in mind that magnesium was able to take copper oxide, copper out of copper oxide, so much so that magnesium was able to make the oxide, the exact oxide, and copper was pushed out as a single element. Now, any element from top can replace element, any element from its bottom, but a bottom element cannot replace any element up top. For example, if I took the same magnesium and if I reacted it with sodium oxide, there would be no reaction. Why? Because I hope you understand magnesium is at bottom in the list as compared to position of sodium. So this reaction would not occur. Make sense? Sir, won't like sodium like replace magnesium? No, as the single one has to replace the one in the compound. Oh, so yeah, magnesium okay. is the single element and sodium is present in the form of the compound. So the single element is supposed to displace the one in compound. That's displacement. Okay. Mm, yeah. Okay. I tend to uh, explain it to my students in a little bit of a different way. Consider magnesium and oxygen are two people sitting on a bench. Sorry, sorry well, copper and oxygen are two people sitting on a bench and magnesium is standing, right? Now, since magnesium being the most stronger one would be capable of sitting on the bench with oxygen and ask 
copper to than, and since copper is unable to fight, being a weaker one, has to than and magnesium can then set. But if magnesium is weak and sodium is sitting on the bench with oxygen, right? Magnesium is weak, magnesium can't fight, so magnesium has to keep standing and sodium would keep sitting. There won't be any reaction. And the same thing happens in life. Usually, <laughs> the stronger people tend to bully the weaker ones, although that's not a good habit, but that tends to happen. Yeah. So consider it like this. Consider the one in the form of a compound is someone sitting on a bench and is actually covering your favorite spot. Now, if he's, he or she is more stronger than you, then you won't be able to move them from their, your spot. But if they're weaker, you might be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. So it works like this. Now, if I talk about more examples, I want you to go ahead and answer my question. Let's say we have zinc and let's say we have iron oxide. What do you think the products would be if the reaction proceeds? You are supposed to answer either way, whether the reaction proceeds or not. If it does, what would be the product? So it's zinc and? Iron oxide. Fe is okay. iron. Sir, it will happen because zinc is more reactive than um, iron. So it would replace iron. So it will be uh, zinc oxide. Displaced. The word is displaced, not replaced. And yes, correct. Oh, yeah, it would form zinc oxide and the iron would be pushed aside. Great. So um, let's take another example. This time, we are going to talk about hydrogen and hydrogen tends to react with zinc oxide. So. So um, there will be no reaction. Why? Because um, <laughs> this hydrogen is less reactive than zinc. Perfect answer, all right? Even if you have to mention the position of hydrogen as compared to zinc in the reactivity series, you can even do that. Writing hydrogen is less reactive than zinc is a perfectly good answer, but if you think you need to explain it further, you can always mention that hydrogen is positioned below in the reactivity series than zinc, mm. all right? Okay. Well, yeah. mentioning this reactive means the same thing. We automatically assume that if hydrogen is less reactive than zinc, then hydrogen must be placed below zinc in the reactivity series, but you can directly write the same thing too. Now, this small exercise would have given you an idea about the kind of reactions uh, in the reactivity series and uh, clearly would have told you how the reactions would or would not be possible in the case of displacement. There are other cases to come up to, but displacement is the first one that we do. Now, this clearly tells you about the second paragraph. If you heated copper with magnesium oxide, nothing would happen. Copper is less reactive than magnesium. Copper isn't capable of displacing magnesium from magnesium oxide. So you get the idea. Now, these re reactions involving metals and metal oxides, apart from displacement reactions, they are sometimes known as competition reactions as well. Right? So moving on, the reaction between magnesium and zinc oxide. Now this should also give you the idea that this reaction should proceed. Remember magnesium is uh, positioned above zinc in the periodic table. So definitely this reaction is possible. Moving on, reaction between carbon and copper oxide. Again, carbon is positioned above copper in the reactivity series. So yeah, this reaction is also possible. So when a black mixture of carbon and red brown copper, uh, actually copper dioxide is also black, is heated in a test tube, the mixture glows red hot because of the heat given out during the reaction. And you are left with pink brown copper in the tube. 
and there is some gas produced. Of course, gas can leave the system if the tube is open-ended, right? So we are left with pink brown copper. Since carbon is above copper in the reactivity series, so it's capable of displacing it, and hence the reaction occurs. Again, in this reaction, where eye protection, the tube will get very hard and remain so for some time. So now you notice that which reactions are possible, which reactions are not. One, two, you should also notice that most of these reactions either require heat or they are exothermic. So we need almost safety with almost all of these reactions. Okay? Mm, yeah. Now, you should also notice something that if the farther the elements are from one another in this series, the more uh, heat involved or the more violent or the more explosive the reaction is. Okay? Notice then when we had to do the reaction with carbon and copper, these are one, two, three, four steps apart. Now, this reaction was violent, but it only got red hot. It wasn't a violent reaction. But when we did the reaction with magnesium and copper, which are actually one, two, three, four, five, six steps apart, the reaction was very violent. If the reaction was in between potassium and copper, the reaction would have been explosive. So more is the distance between the elements displacing one another in the reactivity series, the more explosive or the more violent the reaction is going to be. Make sense? Yeah. Keep the small thing in mind and you would always be able to come up with the right adjective for questions like these. Now, a little bit of chemistry only part, but since these are just two, three lines, let's go through them. Carbon is included in the reactivity series because it is important in extracting several metals, including iron, from their metal oxide. If the metal is less reactive than carbon, which means it's below carbon in the reactivity series, then heating with carbon can be a very cheap way of removing oxygen from the oxide to leave the metal. Copper isn't in fact extracted like this. This reaction is simply a lab illustration that carbon is above copper in the reactivity series. This is just for the students of chemistry only. Now this gives you the idea that how metals are extracted. But in order to completely understand this idea, we need to understand the do know part two. Well, actually some metals are found as metal oxides in nature. For example, iron is most commonly found as not iron in the earth's crust, but as iron three oxide. Now, in order to get iron from this compound, we need to remove this hydrogen. How can we easily remove this hydrogen from it? Heat it with carbon. It's pretty easy. It's going to give us just iron and carbon dioxide. So it's a pretty easy process then because we can use carbon to take oxygen out of it and we'll get pure iron. This is how we extract iron from its iron ore found naturally around the planet in the Earth's crust. Make sense? This is what yeah. this whole paragraph means. So that's what we commonly do. Okay, so yeah. moving on, oxidation and reduction. Now here we need to redefine the two types of reactions that we've already done with, but even if we haven't, let's define them for the first time. If a substance has been oxidized, if it gains oxygen, oxidation is actually gain of oxygen. This is the very definition of oxidation, which means if you react anything with oxygen, let's say carbon reacts with oxygen and it then forms a compound with oxygen. Look, now oxygen is a part of carbon. This reaction would be known as oxidation. So it will increase, oh yeah, okay. It will include like oxygen inside. Sort oxygen like inside that. as a part of the compound. Now, yeah. vice versa, a substance has been reduced if it loses oxygen. Reduction would be the loss of oxygen. Now the reaction I just wrote, I'm gonna write the reaction again. 
iron is found usually in nature in the form of iron free oxide. Now, this can react with carbon and this can give us pure iron. And apart from that, since this is a displacement reaction, we also get some carbon dioxide. Now, this reaction is actually an oxidation reaction for carbon. And at the same time, this is a reduction reaction for iron. You know why it's a reduction reaction for iron? Because iron had some oxygen, which we took out of it. So reduction for iron and carbon never had any oxygen. We actually added some oxygen to it to convert it into carbon dioxide. So it is oxidation. The similar example has been written over here for magnesium and copper dioxide, the reaction we started this chapter with. Now, notice it has been now converted into magnesium oxide and copper. Now, since magnesium had no oxygen, gain in oxygen would be oxidation for it. Now, copper previously had oxygen, but since now that oxygen has been taken out by magnesium, so now copper was under, has undergone reduction, which is loss of oxygen for copper and is now simply in the form of pure copper. So this is how we define oxidation and reduction. So the reaction we have just discussed, the metal and metal oxide reactions, the displacement reactions, the reactions we just called competition reactions are actually redox reactions. What is a redox reaction? A reaction in which both reduction and oxidation occurs simultaneously at the same time. So at the same time, we can see carbon going through oxidation and iron going through reduction. So definitely this one as a whole is a redox reaction because simultaneously oxidation and reduction is occurring in the same reaction. No matter it's occurring to two different elements, but definitely since it's occurring, we have a shorter name for it. We call it a redox reaction. Okay. Like Okay, there are some more definitions too. Now, we have some names like reducing agent and oxidizing agent. Now, the easier way to remember it is that the oxidizing agent, and now I'm going to use different color, the reaction, which is oxidation reaction, actually tells us about a reducing agent. This one is a reducing agent. And the reaction, which is reduction reaction, actually tells us about the oxidizing agent. All right? So seems like a somewhat a difficult topic, but let's define them. It would make it easier for you to understand what I just said. So reducing agent, we are starting off with carbon. This was the reducing agent is a substance that reduces something else, all right? So in mm -hmm. our case, carbon is the reducing agent because it takes oxygen away from iron free oxide, reducing it. So reducing so agent sir, reduces someone, but oxidizes itself. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna quote a real life example. There is a common job by the name of traveling agents, right? Yeah. Traveling agents are the people that help you travel throughout the world. The word traveling agent does not mean he or she would keep traveling herself. It actually means that he or she is going to help you travel, right? So reducing mm -hmm. agent means that helps something else to reduce. Since iron free oxide is re reducing, so carbon would be known as a reducing agent because it helped him reduce. On the other hand, carbon is getting oxidized, so iron free oxide would be the oxidizing agent because it is helping carbon to get oxidized. And the same thing is mentioned over here in the definition. So something that we call a reducing agent is that helps something else to get reduced 
And of course, they themselves get oxidized. And for the oxidizing agent, they help other substances to get oxidized and they themselves get reduced. Other way, it's pretty easy to find out the reducing of the oxidizing agent. The substance undergoing oxidation is a reducing agent and the substance undergoing reduction is an oxidizing agent. That's the easiest way to actually uh, identify them. Make sense? Yeah. So if you remember this quick way to identify them, means the substance undergoing reduction is an oxidizing agent, vice versa, the substance undergoing oxidation is a reducing agent, it would be really easy for you to remember it. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. So I'm going to raise all of it. I'm going to move further. Remember, an oxidizing agent always gets reduced in a chemical reaction, and a reducing agent always gets oxidized in a chemical reaction. Okay, yeah. moving on. There is another way to define oxidation and reduction. Now, that way is known as electron transfer. Okay, so mm -hmm. we are going to look at this reaction again. Magnesium and copper are metals. They're both made up of metal atoms. But copper to oxide and magnesium oxide are both ionic compounds. Now, in this case, you need to closely understand that which one of these actually Reduce, uh, lost electrons and which one of these gained electrons. Now, you, what you can do is that the ionic compounds can be written in the form of separate ions and it would give you the idea which one is losing or which one is gaining electrons. Now, we are converting this copper oxide into this form and we're converting this magnesium oxide into this form. See, this compound actually formed because copper two and these powers were reverse multi cross multiplied, giving us this, which we simplified into this. Now we are taking that all the way back and converting them into these forms. This is how this is done. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? So we yeah, actually, yeah went reverse of what we previously taught you during the chapter of ionic bonding and making yeah. formulae. So we taught you that these are specific valencies which were gained uh, after the law of the gain of electrons forming cations or anions and how we write their formulae by simplifying them, reverse uh, cross multiplying them, then simplifying them and converting them into formulae. Now, what we are doing is the exact reverse. We are converting the formulae back into the ion. That's what we just did. Now, if you notice and if you look at it, you would understand a metal with no charge is now converted into its ion with plus two. And the plus two copper ion from here has been converted into a metal with no charge. Now, I hope you understand that magnesium has been converted into this state, Mg2 positive. And I hope you understand that copper 2 positive has been converted into this state in the, in the reaction written above. I hope you understand that we can convert magnesium atom into magnesium 2 positive ion by losing two electrons. Mm. And yeah. we can actually convert, and let me rewrite it a little bit. We can actually convert this into this by adding two electrons. So in terms of electron transfer, this lost electrons and this gained electrons, right? And instead of teaching you it on the next page, let me tell you here on the same page that loss of electron is known as oxidation 
and gain of electron is known as reduction in redox reaction. And that's yeah. the very definition written on the next page. So let's go to on the next page and understand the same things that, that I just wrote. Since I've written it already, it should give you an idea that the oxide ion does not change in this reaction. It ends up with a different partner, but totally unchanged itself. What happens is that magnesium atoms are turning into magnesium ions by losing two electrons. Now, those exact two electrons are gained by copper ions to form copper atoms. If we describe redox reactions in terms of loss or gain of electron, you would understand automatically that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. We use a mnemonic of oil rig. Again, we are using a mnemonic oil rig in which O stands for oxidation, I stands for is, L stands for loss of electrons, R reduction, I is, G stands for gain of electrons, oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. That's the very definition of oxidation and reduction. Now, you must be thinking that we have already defined oxidation and reduction. Why do we need another definition? Actually, both of the definitions are correct and both of the definitions represent oxidation or reduction. So let me clarify again. Let me move back a couple of pages. Let me make sure that you understand. So if a substance gains oxygen, that is oxidation. So oxidation is gain of like oxygen. But at the same time, oxidation is also loss of electrons. So whether a substance gains oxygen, you're going to call it oxidation, or if the same substance tends to lose electrons, the same thing would also be known as oxidation. On the other hand, reduction, let's define reduction both ways. Reduction was loss of oxygen. On the other hand, reduction is gain of electrons. So both of these definitions also represent reduction. Make sense? Yes. Actually, you are supposed to remember both definitions and whenever the examiner asks you, you actually can write both of them. Well, what we prefer is writing this definition. We all, always say to our students that prefer this definition for oxidation and reduction. But if examiner tells you this definition, ask you the other one, write the previous definition. So it's always up to you or always up to the examiner how he manipulates the question, and you can go ahead and answer it accordingly. Make sense? Yeah. Great. Okay, so moving on. Now the reaction between zinc and copper to sulfate. And in this case, we're not just reacting solid, we're actually reacting a solid with, an, with a solution. Now, understand that zinc was placed on top on the reactivity series in comparison to the position of the copper, which was placed at bottom. So of course, copper can exactly displace it, forming a uh, zinc can exactly displace it, forming zinc sulfate and leaving copper aside. Since zinc is more reactive than copper, so now you understand why this reaction proceeds, but this example is not about the procession of reaction that you already know. Anything on the top of the reactivity series is capable of displacing anything at the bottom. So yeah, zinc being more reactive than copper can definitely displace copper. What this reaction is about is that we need to write this reaction in the form of ion. So the ionic compound, not the metal, of course, you can't distribute metals into ions. So this stays as it is. This is a metal, this stays as it is. But since this is an ionic compound and this is an ionic compound, we actually bifurcate it into two different ions, copper ions and sulfate ions. We again bifurcate it in this one into two different ions, zinc ions and sulfate ions. Now notice we have the same sulfate ion with the same charge on both sides. We have a 
special name for these kind of ions, and these are spectator ions. I hope you understand. Can we repeat that once again? Spectators. Okay, I'm going to repeat it by giving you another example. Now, uh, we had a football World Cup last year, and uh, you can understand that anybody into in that specific stadium or ground can be bifurcated into two kinds of people. The one kind are the players, which actually play the game. And the other kind are spectators. They don't actually play the game. The purpose they are there is to enjoy that game as a spectator. Yeah. They just simply enjoy the game. They don't directly influence the game. Someone who directly influenced the game are called players. So imagine the more reactive metal and the less reactive metal are their ions to be players in this reaction. And these ones in yellow are actually spectators in these reactions. We have their name as spectator ions. Who are spectator ions? Who have no change in their formulae or in their state. I mean, of course, their charges. Notice, zinc has no charge over here, and now zinc has a plus two charge. So yeah, there is a difference in charge. Copper has a plus two charge over here. Copper has no charge over here. So yeah, there is a difference between copper. So zinc and copper are actually players. But this sulfate ion has the same formula and the same charge on both sides of the reaction. So this is a spectral ion, because nothing happens to it really. Right? If yes. we take these spectator ions out of the equation, we can convert a chemical equation into an ionic equation. And that's how we actually form ionic equation. Now, you are familiar with another type of equation. Let me clarify. Let me put a little bit of a background. When we started off with chemical reactions, we told you, First of all, there is a word equation, right? That was yeah. the first one. And then we told you that there is a symbol or chemical equation, which means you can write the same equation in symbols. You can write the same equation in words. This time we are giving you another kind and that is an equation. Now the first one consists of words as the name suggests, word equation. The second one consists of symbols of elements or compounds. The third one specifically consists of ions in the equation, not just elements or compounds, hence the name ion equation. But how do we come up with ion equation? We write a simple redox reaction. We take out the spectator ions, and the equation is automatically converted into an ion equation. Let's clear it up. Notice the spectator ions in yellow colors you take them out, you write the rest of the equation. There you go. You have the ionic equation. Yeah. That's how we write it. Remember the method. That's how you're going to attempt it every single time. Yes. Now, okay. if I don't look at the expected lines, I remove them, I convert them, is this into an ionic equation. And then I further discuss this equation. So take a look at this. This equation is now really easy to understand. Zinc is in the form of atom over here. And after loss of electrons, it was converted into a positive ion. Now, definitely, zinc un has undergone oxidation. Copper, on the other hand, are actually ions on the left-hand side. But after gaining some electrons, they're converted into atoms on the right-hand side. So copper has definitely undergone Reduction. Loss of Sir, electrons is equal to oxidation, gain of electrons is equal to reduction. Yeah, you were saying? Yeah, so sir, every every metal will, I mean metals, they will lose electrons and they will have oxidation. And then whereas the inherent metals, they will gain electrons, right? No, these are both metals. The point is, let me yeah. rephrase your sentence to make it correct. The more reactive metal with loose electrons and will undergo oxidation and the less reactive metal will gain electrons and will undergo reduction. 
actually both of them are metal but the more we reactive don't. one tends to oxidize and the less reactive one tends to reduce actually if i say the more reactive one oxidizes and forces the less reactive one to get reduced would not be a bad thing would actually be very accurate the point i'm trying to make is that zinc is more reactive so it forces copper some electrons reduce it and it self oxidizes so the more reactive metal actually tends to direct the whole reaction in the way it wants just like the strong people tend to manipulate scenes and sometimes stories and sometimes uh the people and events around them they try to influence them convert them into the way they want and pulling again i'm back to that example a negative one <laughs> but uh this is how it goes the more reactive metal actually is the directive for the whole reaction it oxidizes it itself and force feeds electrons to the less reactive ones uh, forcing them to reduce <laughs> all right okay now uh, a little bit of key points when we looked at the reaction between magnesium and copper oxide above we also wrote ions in the equation but we did not separate them completely because the ions were in solid in solid we do not separate them completely but we can separate everything like this in a solution so what you can do is that you can write the separated ions only when they are present in aqueous solution you can't write separate ions for solid right yeah if i go back i will see the same thing let me actually show you that There you go. Take a look at this. Both are solid, so we don't write the ions separately. We write the ions. We do mention them, but we don't write them as separate ions. Notice this. This one is separate ions. There is a plus mm -hmm. sign in between both. They are written separately. That's what he is talking about. Why are these written separately? Because in a solution, ions are free to move around separately. in solid they are not so we, we write are. as they exist they exist together in solid so we don't write them separately in a solid they exist separately in a solution so we write them separately whenever they are in solution form our writing represents their nature second key point which copper to salt you started with should not matter as long as it was soluble in water copper to chloride copper to nitrate could react in the same way with zinc because chloride ions nitrate ions uh, or sulfate ions it does not matter they are all spectators so even if this reaction was not with copper sulfate but with copper nitrate or with copper chloride all negative ions sulfate nitrate chloride are spectator ions they aren't participating in the reaction they are just spectating the whole reaction so they really don't matter the reaction would proceed in the same way make sense yes okay great so finalizing it zinc loses electrons so oxidation copper gains electron reduction writing in this way just the equation for zinc or just the equation of copper and one is ionic half equation so now ionic equations have a subtype known as ionic half equation if you write just the oxidation equation this is known as oxidation half equation and if you write the just the reduction equation that is known as reduction half equation so the examiner may ask you to only write a half equation out of the whole equation Mm, yeah so you might have this whole equation towards for yourself like this let's say you have this but the examiner may ask 
you to write the ionic, uh, my bad, the oxidation or the reduction half equation out of it. Then you need to point out which one oxidized or reduced and write accordingly. Yeah. Okay. And yes. when you do so, correct number of electrons is something you need to mention. Since zinc loses two electrons because of this plus two charge, so two electrons are lost. Copper is going from plus two to its normal or zero state. So of course, two electrons are added. So make sure you put the electrons correctly. How would you know which, how many electrons to uh, write or not? The plus sign or the minus sign means one electron. Similarly, plus two or two minus means two electrons. Three plus or three minus means three electrons change. That's how easy it is. Since this is plus two, it means there were two electrons. Since this is plus two, it means there were two electrons involved. That's how easy it is. It shouldn't be a problem, right? Yeah. Great. So 